Hello everyone, this is Under the Mayo, and uh, I'm here with Frederick Olson, the game director, creative lead um, behind Amnesia the Bunker, uh, which just had a, a big Halloween update, free update, that added a bunch of uh, replay value with a, a new difficulty mode and modifiers. Uh, so um, I wanted to have... Uh, I wanted to have Frederick Olson on here with us to talk a bit about the game. Uh, so, Frederick, welcome. Thank you. Uh, happy to be here. Look, been looking forward to it. Yeah, this is great. Um, have you done uh, many of uh, like any podcasts or interviews um, surrounding the game? No, this is the first one. Uh, I've had some invitations, but like following the release of the game, it's been a bit of a like, first of all, we had to sort out the Halloween update and mm -hmm. then also taking some time off like with family and stuff. So I've been, sure. I also pushed you forward a, a month or so when you asked. So yeah, so we... there's, there's been more, more requests, but I've kind of been pushing them oh. uh, forward a bit. Okay. Um... So uh, once the game came out, um, what did you guys get busy with? What did you focus on? As soon as the game came out, what were you focused on? Did you immediately decide on the update material or was there uh, you know, quality of life changes or bugs or what did you have to focus on? Uh, let's see. That was a, like every single release is so turbulent. So you become mm -hmm. you kind of forget what was going on. But I mean, there was some bugs we had to sort out, but it was a fairly bug free uh, release for us, which was cool. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, we as it always goes, it's it's um, we have these ideas coming up. And they often come up quite late in the in the project, and then you come come to the point where you feel like, okay, uh, these things we should have had almost in the first version, and then you just start piling them up and putting them in a list. So we were kind of ready to go with the update immediately afterwards after the release. So we started on that as soon as possible, basically. So and a lot of the the ideas were already clear. Uh, but then more popped up as we were like looking into the feedback from people and seeing how yeah I've seen so many playthroughs of the game and and it, you start getting an understanding of where we could make an impact uh, for example with the unpredictability of the monster and stuff like that uh, was pretty obvious we could do something there so yeah what other things did you notice in watching playthroughs or getting feedback uh, what uh, what came up right away of things that you knew you wanted to to add to the game i mean for example like <clears throat> one of the things is infinite fuel it's you see mm -hmm. people uh, uh, infinite fuel in the generator i mean i mean, you see some people saying like I, I, i'm sorry I, it looks great the game but i can't play it i can't play games when there's a timer involved and it's kind of like okay we're doing this big update we have all of these settings that we're going to do. So why not include like an infinite uh, generator time mm -hmm. as one of them? It's up to people to customize their own experience. So that's one of them. Uh, also, of course, people uh, not always in, uh, they, they don't say it always as a negative for the game, but people are hating the rats sometimes. So, oh. I mean, that's also, <laughs> that's also one thing. I mean, it's part of, we're going to probably come to that during this session, but I mean, it's part of what uh, what the game is all about, having to tackle the rats as well, because they create this kind of uh, environment where where you're likely to make noise and stuff like that. So, But if people find them too frustrating, then maybe have another s setting that allow them to actually make them less... Um, less of a threat so but apart from that and the unpredictability of the monster i think uh, which was also a big hype in the team when we started testing it out because we've been playing it so much the game and with the unpredictability uh, parameter that we also included actually in hard mode now so once you play the game once if you play it on hard mode the unpredictability the increased unpredictability of the monster is is um, set to on so so that adds so much uh, also for us we are very familiar of course with the game so could you yeah. get into uh, that a little bit when you say the unpredictability what like what specifically have you added to his intelligence to make him more unpredictable 
I mean, actually, that's something we've we've been talking about. Should we even mention it? There, there's be, been people asking me, and I've kind of mm. said, hey, if I if I tell it, it won't be unpredictable okay. anymore. Okay, I, I, res <laughs> I respect that. I respect that. Yeah. Um, uh, I wanted to say that um, I'm really glad that you took this direction with the modifiers because um, games will add cheats, but they don't always add ways to make the game more difficult. Uh, mm. Which is just great for replay value, you know, to that that extra challenge. You know, like, oh, you know, what if I could make the enemies move twice as fast, or what if I could yeah. take away my ability to save and and actually not just have to implement things yourself, but actually do them in game. This not many games actually do that, and so it's been really nice to see you do that because it made me, I don't know, it, it made me fall in love with the game all over again because now I can tweak the experience myself, and I actually probably should have. Um, because I replayed on Shellshock, and yeah. I used to, like last summer, I did a under an hour speed run, Deathless, and then I played on Shellshock, and it took me four hours. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so there's definitely a difference. But I felt like I should have lowered the resource amount even more than what it is on Shellshock yep. because I still end up with a lot of stuff. Yeah. yeah. No, that's that's it's so fun with that because even it was super important for us to even set shell shock. So if you check, I think almost all of the parameters you can even set even lower. one step higher at, yeah, uh, yeah, or yeah. lower, yeah, yeah, more difficult. So that was super important to us to kind of make that. This game has been all about challenge from from day one. The like everything from stepping when you wake up in the bunker to the very end of the game should have a, a almost like 100% of challenge to the player. So there's, as you know, very little cinematics in it. There's, uh, you can skip the intro scene uh, once you finish the game once and those kind of things. So it's built around the challenge. And if people want to ramp that up even more, why why shouldn't we let them? Um, and it's been super fun for me personally as well to just try out, I've tried out setting everything to max, even with the no save. And I, I think I last lasted 20 minutes or something. Yeah, because he's because he's there right away. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Which is awful. It's just like, yeah. wow. Um, so that that uh, focus on a challenging experience, like from beginning to end, um, how, how did you come across that approach? I mean, coming from the the previous installments in the amnesia series to what the bunker is how, how different would you say uh the design philosophy was and how did you arrive at the point where you decided that's the direction you want to go i mean it was very early on because when i pitched this idea to thomas uh, thomas grip uh, who is the founder of the the studio um I pitched it as a smaller project and I kind of said I want to do would be fun to make a game that is more along the lines of the play, games that we played as we when we were younger and when you had to kind of just put pour everything you had <clears throat> into a game in game, order to for example yeah. what games oh let's see I mean uh, Oh, what games! Now everything that pops up is. I was a big Sierra Online, <laughs> Sierra Online fans. So I played Police Quest and all those, and they. Oh, are okay, sure. okay. <laughs> yeah, but, yeah, absolutely. Uh, but then, I mean, every. So I, I had an Intellivision. My father bought. Do you know Intellivision? Yep, I do. <laughs> I did. I didn't have one, but historically, I know it. Yeah, and and I mean, even those games, they were like yeah. everything was so clunky. You had to kind of just learn uh, everything there yeah. was no no internet to check how to do anything uh, and and also coming to sh it's been a like a philosophy for me at least that games should be it, 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 it what games are in their purest form in my opinion is a challenging experience even if you take a game like chess you put it in front of each other that you're there for the challenge of course maybe yes. the social aspects as well but i mean tetris whatever it's it's the challenge that makes them fun uh, and in a way i'm thinking we're kind of 
yeah, I'm, I'm not. Uh, I don't want to make this sound like I'm hitting down on on other games, but there is a lot of games now that ca- need to cater to a big audience, uh, and uh, they are they become more handholdy and maybe more cinematic in a way, and and you you lose some of that feeling of reward uh, after having actually been challenged with something. So I guess it, and that was the feeling I had with tons of games when I was younger. Every game almost was a challenge because you could never, I think there was a telephone number you could call for certain games in order, if you wanted to, in Sweden it was at least, if you wanted to know how to, how to, uh, uh, get over certain bits in games you could call that number and there, there was oh yeah I, on games. the on the in the box for silent hill 2 there's a number to call for yeah. tips if you need it yeah so so i mean that that for me is where games really shine so it's, it's kind of a this was more of a love letter to that but so the whole idea was based around that based around not having the sanity system because the sanity system is cool and good from the previous games but it's not a, a, a direct impact on gameplay in the sense that the generator in bunker has for example where everything goes dark and all of a sudden everything changes and you will have all of the mechanics playing differently especially the lamp uh, the flashlight for example and those kind of things so it 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 became uh yeah more everything surrounding this and and early on also wanted the game to be uh one save station one save room and then having to replay everything to Whoa. put that pressure on on death how so, which we, how yeah. hard was it to sell that to the team the, you know a one central save area the thing is that this ge- this this project wasn't um, it wasn't really planned to to happen <laughs> it just came out of this and i was not i felt coming out of rebirth i felt i wasn't really done i um, so i i took over that project halfway through uh the rebirth project and and i kind of came out of it we had ideas for example we had ideas for um, how the ghouls could uh, uh, actually have more of a stalker behavior but the game itself is so much reliant on the on the story and it's so many different uh, environments so there's basically no like a stalker you can't implement it sure we could have spent a lot of time doing that for a small section in rebirth like the cistern or in the fort or whatever but that would have made very little use to that game so coming out of it with ideas like that and 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 feeling not really done with everything and saying like so i sold it in quite easily and we said let's just do a small team so we were a really small team on bunker to begin with um uh, and it wasn't that difficult i think people are also like happy to try something new now and get more of the gameplay aspect like focus really hard on the gameplay aspect with the immersive sim uh, kind of uh, approach to to it and and like having player player um accountability or what do you say uh yeah player accountability that's the yeah. phrase i toss around a lot on my channel yeah okay <laughs> yeah so, so so really focus on on those aspects it wasn't difficult to to sell it to the team i think you said uh, that you started that you took over rebirth halfway through so um what what was your position in in the company before that? How did you kind of work your way up to becoming creative director? Yeah, I actually came in after Soma, so I haven't had anything to do with uh, any games before Rebirth, basically. So I came in as an executive producer, um, helping Thomas out running the studio and okay. all of that. But then. Uh, uh yeah thomas is uh, cool in that way he said uh, well we need a, a, a creative lead on rebirth now and i think you should take it on and i said okay let's try it so <laughs> we're not li- really th- we're fairly small studio and very open and not that much into hierarchies or anything like that so right. trying things out and being quite a lean 
uh, in how we do things. So that's how I so went into that. So what's your what's your background? I mean, did uh, did you go to school for uh, for anything in game design? Um, uh, no. Did you did you work at any other? Did you work at any companies that uh, that produced any other games that we would know of? Oh yeah, I did that, but uh, I have a bit of a different. Uh, so I'm getting older now, so I'm. Uh, th there was no schools for game okay. development when I was younger, so I I went to the university, came into uh, actually started working for Toyota for the forklift side of Toyota. I worked there as a project manager, and traveling around uh, on the European side. Uh, so it was a very like business like uh, role, but I've always had this dream about making games. And then I left that company, went into the IT consultancy industry in Stockholm, uh, had a, a year or two there, and then all of a sudden I had this actually football game that I was super intrigued about making. A, uh, and we actually, so I, I just quit, went down to. <laughs> close to zero salary and started uh, making a, a, an online football uh, soccer game um, together with a friend uh, all of a sudden in this. So I completely just changed and went with an idea that I had as a teenager actually. So I was just uh, 11 versus 11 online <laughs> soccer game that we actually ran for many years. Not many people know about it, but it was a very fun experience. And then after that, I actually went into and worked a while for um, uh, Tarsier Studios here in Malmö, uh, who made Little Nightmares. Uh, oh, okay. For, yeah. yeah, I know the game. I just didn't know the studio name yep. behind that one. Yep. Okay. So uh, so there I was a producer, so wasn't really into the creative side there. I was, of course, the, you could call it the creative lead on the football game, but yeah. then Tarsier was more of a producer role, and I came to Frictional and came in as a producer there as well. But now it's kind of changed over to the creative side, which I'm super happy about. Um, but it's been a very, quite a different way into the industry i think i yeah. don't hear many people having that kind of background uh, most people i think they start something out in their basements and then it kind of grows and that's or or they go to school of course we have a good school in malmo for example uh, but um, that was not an option for me when i was younger it was a pretty easy transition going from a producer role to becoming a creative lead on a project I mean, taking over uh, like the creative re lead role halfway through a yeah, project, is like ne did... that's never easy. So okay. I, I mean, I wouldn't recommend anything like that because it's it's difficult. You're coming into something where other people have laid the, all of the groundwork and it's super yeah. nice. I, I love the game and everything. So but it's you need to you need to look at things differently than if you're there from the start. So that is difficult. But. But I mean, going at it now with, uh, with Bunker uh, felt really nice. I think the team has been super hyped about the project since day one. They've been questioning uh, what we were doing at certain points, of course. Mm -hmm. It's a bit of a risky project in our environment. We know, like, as you, as you were saying, um, the generator the, the, uh, that you can only save in one place and all of that, that could have easily become frustrating and... Uh, and uh, was, there, was there hesitation about implementing stuff like that? Was there worry that, that your audience wouldn't, wouldn't like this or that you wouldn't reach new audiences or that it would just be too sort of hardcore, I guess? That, I think the worry was there all the time. Yeah. But uh, I, I mean... Uh, but you need to have a vision and you need to stick with that. Otherwise, you'll just start. I remember, for example, the early prototype had a generator in it. And uh, some people were saying, oh, so we need to go back and forth and fill this generator up. Is that some mm -hmm. people saying like, is that, isn't that going to be like a shore and uh, be like just a frustrating bit of it? But then you need to have that kind of. In my head, I had this moment where everything goes dark. That's what I want to yeah. get to. And it, when we have a bigger environment, when you're out on these runs, out in the bunker doing your stuff, uh, that's where that 
plays in and the, the stress leading up to it, of course, as yeah. well, the time pressure and how it plays in with hiding, for example, because as soon as you have the light on and you sit under a table uh, waiting out the monster, or whatever, you constantly feel this kind of pressure of uh, <laughs> the, the, the fuel is burning out. I need to act now. And that's I, great. just, yeah. So, uh, I mean, you could have easily said, OK, let's not do that and let's not do the save room. And then you start taking away things and it becomes this kind of middle way where where it's not uh, uh, an original concept anymore. And I mean, also for Thomas, uh, so I talk a lot about Thomas here, but it's kind of like we're um, we're now the, the the, the co-owners of the company and all of the studio and all of that so we're running the show together a bit but he's the founder so i mean you look up to him uh in in these kind of things and and he's really good with understanding i think he was worried but he saw and understood that this vision needs to be intact because otherwise i'd lose interest in it um kind of like as from a creative lead perspective that if we were to take away certain things that I felt were important, then the whole uh, whole project can kind of crumble in that way. So he took the risk and let let me roll with it in that, in that sense. So, I mean, that's how you need to do it. Um, I'm, I'm really glad that he great. did. It yeah, was, I'm grateful. <laughs> the, the generator, like um, the generator and the flashlight, like this, the systems work so well together. You know the mm -hmm. uh, the the flashlight. You can use it, but it makes it makes noise and doesn't last long enough. So the more you wind it up, you've got the monster on you. And so you want to find the gas, and uh, and like you said, that moment where you're like, okay, I think I can get through here if I use only two gas cans, and I'll save one, and then you get into the section, and then you step over a wire or something, and then. Mm -hmm fuck and now the monster's here and you go and you hide and you're just sitting there and you're like i'm gonna run out of gas <laughs> and, <laughs> and then and then then you get the thing you need and then poof, it all goes and you just eat that moment of like no 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 <laughs> and and you're like if i if if i die here i i'm i'm gonna lose i'm gonna lose 15 minutes of progress and yeah. it's it's just such a, a high tension moment and where there's some games, I guess, like where you would play, and you if you lose progress, you you feel kind of demoralized, mm -hmm. and then you just kind of repeat it, and you kind of play dumb. And I I didn't personally, I didn't feel that in the bunker when I when I lost all you know twenty minutes of progress, half an hour of progress. I, I mean, I was devastated, but I was just like, okay, let's let's go, let's let's do it again. I just felt I felt confident still, and I don't know, I that was. And usually yeah. you've you've learned something from that first mm -hmm. uh, moment you did that run. So next time you'll do things a bit quicker and you know where to go and avoid that trap that you stepped on and all of that. How did you decide on the RNG factor? Traps being in different places, locker codes being in different places. How did you decide on that? Hmm. I don't know how decisions... Uh, I can't really say this was the moment when... Right. We, I think from... from early point we we have been talking for a long time now about like our previous games they are um you you will make a game that people want to play themselves and maybe not just watch a, a youtuber or a streamer or an influencer or a content creator whatever we call them uh you're one of them right, right. <laughs> uh, but it not not just watch it and then say okay i i know what this game is instead they should go hey, this looks so fun, I want to try it out for myself. And the RNG part of it uh, is a way to switch it up all the time. So very early on, we said no codes should be the same. Uh, mm -hmm. Resources, location should be randomized. Um, and then just we went. And usually that's one I was super worried that we would put that at the very end of the project that been pushing for that to happen as soon as possible because if you put it at the end usually those are the things that you cut okay when 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 you get close to a release and you feel like we need to get this out now and uh, so it was part of the even the first kind of 
pitch deck. Uh, it had the the replayability aspect with the randomization and all of that. Oh, it makes every so it was, playthrough yeah. unique. It's it's yeah. it's what makes it so much fun to play several times. Because if you could just if you could just start the game and then run directly to the to the locker codes and and get the uh, get the valve handle and and the like, what's the point then? At that point? like mm. the game's completely done. So it was yeah. definitely the right decision. I, I was hoping in the update that there would be uh, an option for reset, uh, like reset puzzle solutions upon death or upon reload. Mm. Because, um, for example, in the uh, in communications, uh, where mm. you go in and you find the map of all the beds. And then you find the, the note about the key and who has the key. And then you go and you find the bed. Um, if you find those things and now you know where the key is and then you die. Mm. And then you can reload your save and then go straight to the bed. Yeah. And I was, and the same, I was hoping. Same that with we, codes. Yeah, yeah. I was saying in the same with codes. And I was hoping that you guys would do something where if you reload or you die, the key moves to another bed locker codes reset uh i i was hoping you'd do something like that just to eliminate the possibility of 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 uh because you know technically you could just run in to communications and play dumb and just uh, get the map get the get the uh letter for the where the key is and then die and then just reload and run straight to the bread to the bed you could kind of game the system that way would you ever think about an update that would uh, that would allow for that kind of you know location or code in code reset upon upon loading a save I, we haven't talked that much about it i think it's been mentioned uh, it has been mentioned in the mm -hmm. team but i think also there's technical complications to that okay uh, I, i'm not sure i mean uh but it's it's also something where you kind of feel like okay if the player starts cheating the system then the I understand because it's kind of luring you to do that it, it's kind of like okay but I don't need to do this now I know the mm -hmm. code or whatever yeah. but uh, but it's the, then you're cheating yourself on the experience in a way but I, yeah it's an interesting uh, thing maybe worth uh, thinking about for the future to really. Uh, we have one area, I don't know if you know that, but there is one area that actually randomizes every time. Um, What's that? That's the end, uh, uh, the the arena. Yes, yes, the arena randomizes, the breakable bridge, yeah. the, 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 that changes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so yeah, I mean, I would I would love to see that as just a, as an on and off option, you know. Yeah. Yeah, it's a good good idea, actually. I don't think we've talked much about it at all. So uh, it's maybe something to look for, look into for the future. Hmm. We have a, another smaller update coming, so maybe... Oh, is there going to be a Christmas update to put the monster in a Santa hat? Yeah, of course. Need that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, it's... Uh, I, maybe I can... Uh, actually, you heard it here first, but it's it's actually an uh, an update with some added accessibility okay. uh, functionality. So we want to do that this time. We kind of neglected it in the past, but there is... Uh, what about VR some... support? Oh, yeah. That's the first question that pops up every time we release a game. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, no, that's a, such a that's a whole different ballpark. Of yeah. course, the VR. Um, I would be more interested in actually having a, a feature that uh, hears your microphone when you're playing. That would playing. be cool so, too. Uh, yeah. I Man. think that would be, uh... <laughs> streaming would be out of the question. But <laughs> people be on streams like whispering to their chat. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That would be very. Intense. Yeah, if if you could nail it, like the sensitivity, so it's not just like yeah. A B, but if there's, if there's like a whole spectrum of yeah. of volume, that would be really cool. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah I think. Yeah. Let's see, I I have a I have a list of questions that I took from my viewers. I'm trying to think if there's anything else I want to hit on. Before, I mean, I, I could talk about this game for for ages. I just, I mean, you, you saw my review on it. Then, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, this this game just really hit something special for me, and I it, it I I didn't see it coming at all. I didn't know about this game. I didn't know it was coming out. 
Uh, it was actually uh, G Man Lives that yeah, uh, yeah. he mentioned it to me and he hooked me up with a code and I played it and I was like, whoa, what is this? <laughs> uh, the I What I really love about it is I love the immersive sim elements of it. Um, it was mm. that, was that um, in the early stages of planning for the game or is it something you came across after a while? It was fairly early, but it was not the first, if we talk about the pitch again, it was not part of the first pitch, but everything happened so quickly in the beginning. Uh, when when just mentioned this, like World War One, be a soldier there, have a monster that's roaming the bunker, um, the generator, the gun, uh, the flashlight, those things were basically the the initial concept i think okay. and then, so no grenades no gas grenades no, all, all right. of these things just started piling on top of it and you're just like yeah we need that we need that and everything just it was kind of refreshing because world war one was a perfect technique like uh, technology uh, limit limitation so we can't go for anything uh, super high tech uh, we in a way it was also maybe too limiting but I think that's what what I really love about this game is that we use all of these kind of small things like people are saying if you find a brick the brick is the best thing in in the game and I, <laughs> that kind of shows a small uh, rock is is so important for you and and so we made a lot with low tech and with a lot of yeah just I think it makes it scarier it makes it a uniquely scary experience how did you decide on World War 1 for your setting that was actually someone else mentioning that during Rebirth. Uh, I don't know who it was. I don't remember who it was. Could have been the writer maybe of Rebirth who mentioned that as an idea for a, a DLC. Uh, so it kind of, and that kind of started to, to stick, uh, stick with us going forward. And then coming out of it was like, ah, oh, then we could have a gun. And it felt like, and, and the, light and dark gameplay that we have in it's it's one of the bigger things in amnesia games i think it's always been and then with the generator that runs on fuel it's also perfect so everything just there became a gameplay concept the concept around that and with the revolver gun so i i can't really say i remember exactly how everything came to be but um yeah it was very early with the with the uh, World War One, and it had been kind of fermenting, or mm -hmm. what do you call it, uh, solidifying over uh, uh, during the end of the rebirth project as an idea. Okay, uh, the immersive sim elements is uh, it, it just that's just that's what pushes it over the edge for me. Uh, mm. The the ability to solve these problems and open doors in different ways, like um, there's something I saw on your Twitter. Uh, you have it pinned, I think, and it's someone uh, using a barrel to open a door, and they pour gas on it, and then mm. they they pick up a wooden bucket and they open a door that has a trap on it, it as a flare, and then they they open the door and they catch the flare in the bucket, and then dump it on the on the fire. And I just thought, wow. I, I mean, did did you did you know people were going to be doing that or like did that surprise you or but that's the kind of stuff that makes the game so magical yeah that came out of uh, just all of the mechanics just working together yeah. that was not a design decision we need to be able to do this kind of scenario that right. that just uh, ended up thanks to physics and it was uh, so i don't i doubt that people are actually doing this this feels like advanced uh, bunker gaming <laughs> yeah if you go go about it that way but it's still possible and it's still like I, I even think people are not using gas grenades enough if they have the gas mask i mean it's such a i've seen oh. people write uh, like the gas gas grenades are not that that important but i think they are super useful i think the flares together with fuel is super useful if you don't yeah. have the gun for example so all of these mechanics they they kind of just work together in every single yeah not every you know, gas grenade but... gas grenade gas mask is my backup plan against the monster at the end oh yeah if i can't get him to to die on the bridge 
I'll uh, um, I'll lure him to oh, the middle. Throw them. I'll I'll like I'll try to like block off the bridges with fi with fire, and then I'll just throw just, I'll just throw down a couple gas grenades in the area where you have to pull the 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 the, the, the stones boxes. the yeah. boxes, yeah. and I'll put on the gas mask, and he just can't even <laughs> come anywhere near me. No, no, exactly. So that that's a way to solve the end. Uh, yeah. It's it's so fun. I didn't think about that one. I saw a streamer. Um, do that yeah and i was like when he was doing it i was in the chat actually so he knew i was in the chat as well and i like oh, i hope this works now <laughs> i hope <laughs> yeah. the monster stays out of the gas yeah. now and, and it works so yeah it, there's <laughs> so. You know, there's something um uh, yeah i on my channel i really really like to talk about how games kind of like communicate uh you know their systems and they communicate how to play through experience and challenge and there's there's a moment I noticed near the end where um, so the very end of the game you have to push those boxes to, to step up on one and then step up on the other and then poof, then you can cross the wall um, but in the catacombs like um, in the end I mean is that what you call that the Roman tunnels the Roman tunnels, Roman tunnels. in yeah. the Roman tunnels once you go all the way through there and you you grab the detonator to get out you have to do that. You have to put yeah. two boxes together to jump up out of there. And so you're actually, that had to have been on purpose that you're, yeah. that you're teaching players what they're going to need to do for the end. Cause if you didn't have that teaching moment, people might be wandering around that final boss fight, not knowing what they're supposed to do. Yeah. yeah. That is, that <laughs> is that's... brilliant game design. I just want to compliment you for it. Yeah, but that is um, my designers. I mean, uh, in the team, Max, for example, the design lead on this, he's really good with those kind of things and always thinking one step forward. So I wouldn't take any credit for that. Well, but it's, yeah. Buy it, Max's it steak for me, all right? <laughs> Say it's <laughs> yeah, from Mayo, because that yeah. was like the smartest thing in the game. Like, that was, uh, you know, a lesser team, right, wouldn't have figured that out. And they, yep. they, they would have had just had you there having to figure out that you need to move boxes. And it would have been a moment of massive frustration for a lot of people. But no, like the fact that you did it already, it just, it comes naturally to you. And it's so smart. Very good yeah, job on that. Yeah, cool. Thanks. <laughs> um, so I'll, uh, I'll get into, if there's not anything you want to bring up, uh, we could uh, get into some viewer questions. No, let's go. Let's see what they have. Okay. What they have been asking. All right. Um, this question is from Voidhanger47. He says, I'm curious uh, what you learned from Amnesia Rebirth and Soma in terms of design structure and how you applied those lessons in the bunker. Hmm. So, uh, Soma, I can't really speak for since I came in after that, but Rebirth, okay. Rebirth, so, I, I, I mean, since, yeah, I think it's something we already touched upon with the challenge. I mean, Rebirth has the kind of the opposite approach. When you die to a monster, you have a narrative. Have you played Rebirth, by the way? I have not. I only played the first Amnesia for a few hours. Um, yeah, okay. And that game just didn't resonate with me, no. uh, and so I—I I mean, from that point, I haven't paid attention to the series. So I don't—I don't come from the previous Amnesia games. No, okay, that's cool. Yep. Yeah. Uh, but uh, so so in Rebirth, then um, the, the narrative is the driver, uh, much more than the the gameplay. That, that's yeah. safe to say. So if you die to a monster, there you have a like a. I don't know if I should spoil anything in this, but I mean, I can say then Tassi, the main character that you play, turns more into a monster if you if you die to to any of the monsters in the game. Uh, but you wake up and the monster has left so you can progress. So it's a very different approach to a bunker where you will have to restart at your last save and just yeah. play it again. Um, I mean, that's a, if you call it a, 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 I don't think it's a learning. I don't say, I'm, I'm saying that Rebirth and, and, and Soma and these kind of games 
have a different approach and i really okay. appreciate those games for the, what they are uh but so bunker is very different in that aspect especially with the with the challenge and with the uh, player accountability and uh, maybe player agency as well in a way um so yeah i guess it's something that makes you think what if we made a game that wouldn't uh, help you along if you die to a monster but instead yeah. you'll have to actually push this and, and and of course the death that's always the thing when when a player dies in a game in a horror game how do you make that fe like not feel frustrating but it need to hurt yeah. i mean yeah <laughs> otherwise a consequence. The, yeah. yeah consequence yes yeah. so but apart from that, I, I mean, it's the from rebirth that I mentioned earlier, the, the monsters going out in and out of holes and kind of following that aspect. There was something we couldn't uh, get into rebirth. So it was something All that right. was left uh, for later. So I guess those are the main things. Okay. So not so much lessons learned, but just uh, already knowing the different directions you wanted to take. Yeah. Also, uh, this is actually yeah. I can I can probably tell you tell you that because I have some friends over here. They they were like a group of guys that meet up a few times per year, and they said, okay, let's play the your latest game, Frederick. We can play it on a party, and we started up uh, Rebirth, and uh, it's not that type of a game. It's not a party game. <laughs> <No>. So every <laughs> so everyone was like, okay, it takes a while, and we read some notes, and we're getting into it. It's something that you really should sit on your own or with a one friend, mm -hmm. maybe not not as a party experience. So I actually that was something I said when I kind of brought out the idea for, for Bunker was that this is a game that should be possible to play with my friends uh, on a party. Uh, so skipping the intro straight into the monster, straight into the gameplay aspect of it. So I think that actually kind of could be a lesson learned, but it's rather after development and playing the game that I felt now I want to do a game that I can, that, that can instantly become fun, challenging and engaging in, in, um, in the gameplay side of it, I think. Yeah. And you nailed that because, um, uh, I have some friends that don't really play video games themselves, but they really like watching games or they, they, they like, you know, they like when I show them cool games, like when we mm -hmm. when they come over and we hang out and, uh, the bunker has definitely been one of those games where I would just like, you know, a friend of mine would just sit next to me and I'd just be like, check this out. And I would play, you know, 40 minutes of the bunker and they would just watch and be like, oh my God, holy shit. And it, that, it's a really fun game to show someone. So you really, yeah, you cool. nailed it there for sure. Yeah. Um, uh, okay, I, I have a, <laughs> I, I have a multi-tiered question from Pizachu. He said, what inspired the monster's design? Oh, uh, first of all, I mean, how do we do with spoilers here, by the way? Just checking. Uh, um, well, I mean, I think uh, anyone listening to this is going to be someone who has already played the game or seen the game. So I think I think we're I, I can, think we're fine. I can try and be as spoiler free as possible, but not all the way through. Um, so the monster, of course, is a, a former soldier. So that's yes one thing first of all and if you look at his face uh you can almost see it split in two one is mon more monstrous and the other one is more human like that is one uh, aspect of the design that was important from the get-go uh then the second thing is we wanted it to be more animalistic uh, in a sense uh, i think if it, there's actually any uh, any inspiration that i came with is the it called the relic the book i i think it's called the relic i should probably check should I, can i take a moment just to check if it's yeah. called that yeah yeah that's fine it's interesting to me that um your inspiration for the design comes from the story so you already knew when designing the monster you already knew that the game was going to have the story of the monster being a former soldier. 
yeah. you, didn't, you didn't just start designing a scary monster and then come up with the idea of where it came from after. Nope. Okay, that's we interesting. Knew, we knew uh, for sure it, the, the bigger strokes of the of the story, uh, and and yes, it's it's the relic. Uh, it's uh, in a museum, uh, place out in the museum in New York, uh, where there's a monster. There's a movie, uh, isn't there? Yeah, it's also a movie, but I read the book, okay. so I had my own picture of that monster. I actually saw someone on Reddit saying that, hey, do you think it was inspired by the relic? I was impressed. I should have hmm. should have kept that uh, Reddit. <laughs> um so yeah, I don't think I can't find any images of it. There has been some images, but it and it you could see some similarities to it, perhaps. Okay. But this kind of hunched over, um, it's more of a lizard type mm -hmm. of monster. <clears throat> but we also so it became came down to okay, so what's the logical explanation to how this monster turned in uh, this soldier turned into this monster and of course we early on felt that the lore of amnesia gave us a lot with the 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 vitae the the monster uh, juice that you have going on in in rebirth and and the previous games so that aspect together but he also needs to be able the monster needs to be able to go into walls and stuff like that so i had this we're in a bunker, small space. Maybe we can make him walk on four legs quite often. So it turned out to... We were talking early on a gorilla slash snake type mm -hmm. of... Okay, of, gorilla uh, slash yeah. snake. Yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but it, uh, uh, but, but then uh, the, the, the early animations showed too much of a gorilla. And actually, one of the best things we added fairly late was when he walks on two legs for certain he does that you've probably seen him do that uh, once in a while and that just brings a whole new level to the monster because earlier it was a lot of four mm. walking on all fours so to say okay um next part of pizza Chew's question is did you, did they know from the beginning that they wanted to have a single stalker or, or were there other ideas played around with before mm. Yeah, single stalker, definitely, was yeah. from day one. But then more enemies have been talked about. Okay. Uh, um, so, but yeah, I'm, I'm happy we kind of stuck to where we're at. It's such a fairly concentrated experience. Mm -hmm. And I think, yeah, no, so with one stalker, uh, Kind of funny, I think, how the rats came to be. There was a suggestion early on. Uh, why not bring in rats? It's bunker, so we should have rats. And I was like, uh, we were more of us actually saying, like, oh, rats, it, it's not that fun if they just walk around and attack you. No. So, uh, so instead when... And actually, this is also inspiration. So, I mean, inspiration, it's safe to say that alien isolation has had an inspiration when it comes well. to a stalker. Obviously, uh, yeah. Yeah. And then uh, certain aspects of Resident Evil. So if you look at the, I think it's Resident Evil 2, where the, the big locker room um, in in the police station. Isn't that, is that Resident Evil 2? The big locker uh, room in the police station. Well, I mean. Where you this... had, you need to find some buttons to put on an open. Oh, and the RE2 remake. Yeah. 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 So I was watching that. I was watching a, a playthrough of that actually, and I, I, that just idea with the lockers popped up, and that became the the mission story. Interesting. But yeah, but then all of a sudden, how do we connect all of this? And then there was the art director Rasmus who had said something: Can we not have codes? Uh, we can have codes located on soldiers. You need to find specific soldiers and stuff like that. And then all of a sudden, so soldiers with codes. Uh, there's, lockers there's dog tags, and then rats <laughs> yeah so do you, you have those rats that you they are a nuisance to you but they're also they're not obstacle but they are also something you want to interact with and handle and manage and i think that is so important for the game that you should see that and not just feel like you need to just avoid them or, mm -hmm. or get away from them but you actually need to um, actively counter them somehow in order to get to the dog tags and all of that so 
And yeah. it's and it feels so bad when you finally clear out rats and you probably maybe even you take damage doing so and then you check the dog tag and it's nothing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but that's something you you just need to have. That's uh, great. so that's yeah. Uh, and, yeah. and and could you elaborate a little bit on the flashlight mechanic, um, the, the design of it? Did you go through any iterations of how the flashlight worked? Did you all did you always know that you wanted something that would burn out quick and make noise? Yeah, I think it's from day one. I mean, uh, and that was also just talks in the small team. We were like four people to start with, and then uh, said we want to have. Can we have some kind of noisy? flashlight and then all of a sudden the art director comes up hey i found this and you might not be aware or you might be aware but that this is an actual flashlight. oh yeah from, yeah yeah so so i mean that immediately when we saw the, the kind of video on youtube and heard it making noise and all of a sudden yeah that's that's the one <laughs> and then we have we have made very few iterations to to the flashlight okay so um uh, Trent on Turner 1800 says, how did you decide to include combat as an option this time around? And when did you prioritize the concept of replayability? Uh, so I think we already talked a bit about the replayability, but how mm -hmm. did, like, how did you, how did you go from a series that didn't have combat to, uh, to having combat as an option? I just felt that, I don't know. Uh, I said, in the pitch again, like we need a gun now. It's time for it. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, Just to shake so things up. Yeah, I mean, like we kind of became famous for taking a gun away. So now <laughs> let's let's do the opposite and become famous for putting it back again. No, but I mean, it it, it just felt like it just it's World War One. I. I mean without weapons that would feel very strange like in an in an old castle that that works but in in a bunker in world war one uh, without any means of mm -hmm. of defending yourself or anything like that so it, it came very very early as well part of the initial concept okay uh ross davis 428 says uh in the world of this game is there any way to restore a person who's become a monster? Any way to save them? I don't know. We we. Uh, I don't think. I don't know. I can't answer that question. Okay. Uh, you know, at the uh, at the end, spoilers for the ending. About one of the endings is the monster gets out. Right. What What do you imagine happened to it? Do you imagine it just goes on a rampage in the battlefield? Do you imagine that it goes somewhere else to hide? No, I I mean my imagination says that it's going on a rampage. I mean, yeah. if you look at what he did in the So if you look at the chapel, the I think you get an achievement for entering the beast's lair when you go in there. Um the chapel he's been rigging all of this stuff. Uh, the, the corpses of soldiers in very strange positions and stuff like that. Uh, and the way that we wanted to build this in is that he's got a connection to some higher being. He, first of all, he was religious, so he spent a lot of time in the chapel. But all of a sudden, turning into a monster, he's st starting to get a new drive that is maybe con connected to the rebirth lore where you have a... Uh, uh, a queen, so to say, that kind of controls a lot of these things. Uh, and maybe that connection together uh, turned him into not really fully seeing difference between religion, the, his religion uh, as a person and this new dark world uh, religion and, and became obsessed with uh, trying to prove himself for for this darker side and that's why he's starting to put uh, these corpses up in very strange ways in the in the chapel and i think that's the the trajectory that that monster is on so if you let wow. him out into the world it's gonna do more of that okay. uh, that that's that's my uh how i imagine it 
Okay, are you planning so, an, an Aliens-like sequel where you have a, a, a team of military guys that goes into the, to the next bunker with smart guns and that, pulse that rifles? <laughs> yeah, that would be fun. Yeah, you could take the same concept and, and jump forward 200 years. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, uh, I love the idea to make an amnesia in a more modern setting or, or a futuristic setting, actually. But yeah, yeah. Um, but I, I think that's been done in a few other movies, yeah. starting with A as well. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm Internet Nobody says, what do they think about the video game budgeting in general? And are Frictional planning to stay in the indie zone? Or do they have higher budget game ideas? Uh, and is the studio ready to grow in terms of number of employees? No, we're really happy with the, the size we're at now. We're like 35 people. Okay. Uh, and we have two projects running in parallel. And we have, and like, not in production in parallel. We have one project always in pre-production and another one in production. That's the, at least how we want to work. So that we can have a small team on pre-production while the other, the bigger team is working on production. And then once we're done with that, we switch over and start another. So we we'll kind of have two lanes. Uh, and uh, and then we have the engine development. I mean, we have our own engine and we're super happy about having our own engine. Um, and so we've been saying that the type of games we make, I think maybe you touched upon it, but I mean, the holistic aspect of game development that we try and do, where everything should come together, gameplay, narrative, art, uh, everything to animations. I mean, ev keeping one vision will become so much more difficult if you grow too much. You're going to start having like bigger like okay so all of a sudden we have an art team that needs maybe that that the creative lead for example i've been in talks with everyone i i can take a meeting with anyone in the in the team and instead of kind of growing to a point where a creative lead has to have producers or or other leads we have other leads as well but they are we're all in the same group <laughs> because we're so small um that that's not something we feel are interesting. So that means keeping it down to similar size. Uh, I mean, is is where we're probably gonna stay. But we have like the bunker is a fairly small project. Yeah. So we have bigger projects in the pipeline, but they're still not a major difference. It's still gonna be similar size uh, to what we've done in the past. Uh, um, I don't know if you can even comment on this, but uh, would you consider a, a follow-up to the bunker? Uh, I mean, I've been considering it uh, a lot, but not just from a personal perspective. But there's, uh, like, I, I love the game. Um, probably <laughs> can hear that or see that when, yeah. when I post on Twitter and stuff like that. But I mean... I think there's also other stuff we can do. So I, I, I don't think it's been interesting to toy with ideas, but I'm, I'm not seeing it right now. But I should also not say, uh, who knows in the future. But but for now, I, I it's it's not there. Uh, Would you? Um, okay. Uh yeah, a direct sequel to The Bunker, I mean, maybe not, but I'm more curious if you are planning to stick with the immersive sim style of level design and gameplay going forward. Multiple ways to get into doors or to figure out problems like that. Is that, is that something that you want to hold on to as you go forward? Yeah, for me, uh, like, the, so this is also like, it has to be right for the creative lead that runs. So, so this is very important, I think, for from a design perspective for us. It's important that the creative lead kind of has a vision for the game, and uh, if if I, as a creative lead, burn for a certain thing, then that's where I should go with this project. Uh, and for me, the immersive scene 
aspect is super important. And the, if you look at Bunker, it's honestly halfway to where I would take the project that I was actually supposed to work on uh, when I pitched this. <laughs> so I don't know if that made sense at all. But yes, for me, going more into this where it's a tactile, immersive uh, approach is definitely where I want to you want to continue more. in that yes. kind of okay that's that's good to hear oh you know speaking of immersive sim aspects uh I, i'm sure everyone's dying to know why can you not burn down wooden doors <laughs> if you yeah, think it's possible the, it probably yeah, is why can you not burn down? I, I mean i i know why it's a balanced thing uh yeah. but um like, you want to hear it from me i want to hear it from you <laughs> Yeah. Why, like <laughs> no. So some. I. I would have loved to make it so. Uh, to be honest, but that would hurt the game. Um, it's. It's a thing where you can. You can see it, and you can say, okay, this makes no sense. Why can't you burn a door? But if we were to do that, all of a sudden, you. You, you mentioned this uh, that I had pinned on my Twitter, for example. That thing wouldn't be necessary. All of a sudden, you would just pour. Uh, you wouldn't have to use the explosive barrel, for yeah. example. You could just pour fuel on uh, on the floor and throw uh, uh, the the flare there. Yeah. And when you have the lighter, then a lighter and a fuel breaks down a door, and all of a sudden that is your all, like almost your only need. Yeah. Lighter, uh, lighter I, and I, gas, and then you're done. Yeah. So sometimes, I mean, a game needs to suffer in let's say logic or realism or whatever for the greater sake of the gameplay <laughs> okay you know what i i've actually i think i can solve the problem right here we're going to do it right here live i'm going to solve the burning down door let's problem okay the monster got out all the soldiers totally freaked out and so what they did is they reinforced every wooden door with steel bars behind it yeah that's all right. All so yeah. you so you burn down a door, but you still can't get yeah. in. We just need to write a note about that and put somewhere. <laughs> you can <laughs> I, you can figure it out. Nah, I, I and think I can a, have your name at the bottom of the note. Hey, I, I, so yeah. Under the mail. I would yeah. love it. Put my little logo on one of those little story notes you find. Oh, yeah. 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 There you go. Um. Let's see. Uh, oh, okay. This last question I have from viewers is uh, uh, is probably my favorite it says what was the biggest waste of time in development what like what uh what went on longer than it should have before you decided like it wasn't the right direction this is fun because i love this stuff like what what, what were the bad ideas you know, or like yeah, were the problems there, i'm sorry this is the in a way this was probably the there was very little cut in this game so it's it's a rare thing i think because there's always cutting down on things but this just i can't see anything it's probably like we can find details that were drawn back or tweaked back like the rats they were much more aggressive earlier so you could hardly walk past them but i mean there's nothing that so we spent a lot of time on rats and especially after gameplay testing with external partners and stuff we could see that the rats were too difficult so we brought them back we we uh, but but i can't even think of one thing that was cut from this game that we spent time on i mean well, like, um, wait, this question is by clicky 101 by the way thank you for the question uh it doesn't have to be something that was cut but is there something that like maybe uh Maybe an idea that you thought was good, but then as you were working with it, you realized it wasn't the right idea. Okay. Uh, yeah, I have one. Okay. <laughs> is it is it is it the the laser rifle? Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, no, we actually the, da have the dash, the, uh, maybe the double dash. <laughs> the double dash, yeah. No, it was a, such a small thing, but it, this is also fun because I realized I missed one thing that I had early on in the that we wanted to have in the in the prototype. Uh, very early on was that I was so hooked on this um, on having this uh, stopwatch, and so 
the the idea, my idea from the beginning was that you would start and stop that stopwatch manually. And that's one of the places where I could just see when we started playing with that, when we had it implemented. <laughs> this is not going to work. No one is going to use this stopwatch. So we why, turned why did, it into... Why did you feel that way? Too um, much work and trying to, like... First of all, you had to kind of count how long does it take before it dies. It's, it's it was so complicated everything. So instead, we just said, let the player, the character, just uh, set the the watch manually. And I think that was a much better decision. I think uh, okay. it's but it's it, the stopwatch is a fun area because what um, what happened there was that. Um, a lot of people actually in the team said no one is going to play with the stopwatch. And I I think I watched you playing Shellshock the, 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 a week back or something. Mm. And you are not playing with the I, I I Since my first playthrough, I looked at that thing. I said, absolutely not. I'm not yeah. taking up two inventory spaces with a flashlight and a watch. And so I, I just never used it. Yeah. But for the first playthrough, I see a lot of people walking around with it, and they have it out. And then when it, when they have it out, it's ticking as well. So it's kind yeah. of stressing <laughs> you out, and you're put, putting yourself through that. So I was so happy that we kept with that uh, the, the stopwatch because I, no one said it doesn't do anything. Why why do you need it there? But it it's just the mental space of you dressing out and thinking about the generator and yes. being reminded of that. Uh, it's good that it's course, there. I just didn't yeah. use it myself. No, no, no. I, I don't use it anymore myself either. So, but that is super fun. I, I another day I have on on Frictional's YouTube now. We have a me playing through a version of Shellshock, uh, but I turned off the uh, saving cost fuel aspect in that. So it, it's almost a three-hour playthrough with me playing through the game, and it's so fun because looking at and how I feel about playing the game, it's still fun. And it's still scary for me. And I'm jumping, mm -hmm. I think, three or four times in the during this playthrough. Um, and uh, so I think this is why we wanted replayability, almost so that we ourselves can have fun testing the game. Mm -hmm. And I played the game. I, I don't think it's an exaggeration that I played the game from start to finish in different periods of this development process, maybe up to 100 times. And I'm still getting scared. I believe <laughs> especially it. With, yeah, especially with the un unpredictability aspect of it. So, I, I mean, I don't know how I... This was maybe a tangent. I don't even remember what you asked now, but uh, I, <laughs> That's okay. I went on a tangent here, yeah. Now, um... Are there any other things that you'd like to talk about with this game? I mean, like, uh, that's the end of the questions. Uh, that I have my own and from from the audience, but I mean I have some more time. We can we can get in anything else you want to talk about. Um, actually, uh, speaking of the flashlight, um, did you always know that you wanted the flashlight to take up an inventory space and not just be something you have on your person? Yeah, it just uh, I mean it was never questioned either during development. Right, because uh, like you know, you look at uh, you know other games where you just have a flashlight, and that's not mm. part of your inventory. You know, the example that comes to my mind is Signalis. Did you play Signalis from last year? No, I haven't had the chance yet. Uh, if, so I, if you I, have time, then yeah. it's it's a must play, and it's a six inventory item limit game as well. Uh, mm. And like the bunker, when you find the flashlight, it takes up an inventory space and. A lot of people didn't like that. I'm one of them, mm. and uh, and in a recent update, they have actually I, I believe they have are they have actually made the flashlight something that is not taking up an inventory space anymore. Mm. And I think I think that's a much better decision for Signalis because the bunker is a game that you can play entirely without the flashlight. You yep. can make it through, like, and so it's a decision of I'm going to use up an inventory space for this thing because it's going to be helpful, not because I need it. Uh, and in Signalis, Does there, that mean it, that, yeah, yeah, sorry. in Signalis, there's like areas where you're like, 
if you're walking around without the flashlight, you're fine for a while. And then you come into a room where there's rooms where if you do not have the flashlight, you cannot open the door because doors activate by light. Oh, okay. And so yeah, you that, get, you get somewhere and you're like, fuck, I got to go back for the flashlight now. It, it like, it's annoying. And so they've made that and the photo module, which is something it's really smart in Signalis. They have this like, digital eye camera thing and uh so when you find puzzle solutions you can take pictures in game Mm -hmm. if you have this thing and then so you can once you get to the actual puzzle later you can just pull up your photo archives and see the thing you took a photo of in another room instead of having to like look up the answer or remember or take a screenshot with your phone there's an in-game way to take photos of things and that and they've also made that not take up an inventory space and so i i felt those are really good right. changes but yeah, i something. wouldn't apply that to the bunker because the flashlight is not something you even need really yeah and especially since we we kind of give the players certain things like the infinite fuel uh and the bike. and the inventory expansions as well yeah, and in yes exactly but also that like the infinite fuel with you p- picking up the the bottles and running and making these fuel runs i mean then okay decide if you need the flashlight or not i mean <laughs> it's it's up up to you then and that's also kind of an interesting choice for the player to make in those cases but yeah and we have the the, the inventory upgrades of course no, I, I completely agree with you. The flashlight should be in the inventory, and it's never been a question in that sense. Uh, the the main the main thing that has been brought up is why is there only one bullet in every in every box? In every box. Oh, okay. Well, I mean, if because if it was a bullet, you wouldn't see it. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So it's, it's a video game. Practical. Yeah. You got to do it yeah. that way. Yeah, yeah. I and man, you guys don't give any shotgun shells. I'm serious. I don't. I, I've played through the game multiple times where I get the shotgun and not a not one shell. I have just didn't find one Lambert's shell. Lambert Slocker, Lambert Slocker always have it. I don't always o- open Lambert Slocker. No, you forget it. Maybe yeah. when you get back. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, no, I, we're, um, they, they are not, I mean, from the beginning as well, you know, the first time you play it, you don't even get the shotgun until very late, so. Yeah, I didn't get the shotgun until I killed the shotgunner. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You can't get it before then on your first playthrough. So it's only a new game plus Wait, where you what, can what, find it in the locker. What do you, really? The first mm-hmm. playthrough, there's no shotgun in the locker? Correct. <laughs> I guess I didn't notice that. No, why why is that. why is that? We wanted uh, it to become a kind of a choice of how you treat Toussaint and down in the Roman tunnels um, the first time around. I mean, the narrative is most interesting the first time you play the game. Right. Um, and if you had the shotgun already, then maybe it's easier to just let him live but all of a sudden when you're there you you want that shotgun maybe you go out of your way to to actually kill him what is his name again Toussaint Tous- Toussaint Toussaint yeah and yeah I don't know if I if I pronounce that correctly to and, be honest I'm and and who was and who was he in the story the um, because he's down the there walking around like a madman right hmm. So uh, cut his uh, cut his eyes out. So he's a blind person down there, and why, firing at anything that moves. And why did he cut his eyes out? Yeah, because he was down in the those Roman tunnels where the gas, this kind of liquid gas, had uh, started to give him hallucinations. And he writes in his uh, notes that he found this uh, this world down there much more enjoyable. So he wanted to be part of that. So he actually. Uh, went down into the Roman tunnels when they blew up the exit or entrance to the Roman tunnels on purpose because he he had already started turning a bit mad at that point. But then being down there, he turned even more mad and uh, he thought that he would see things better if he cut out his eyes. Okay. (laughs) Well, fair enough. (laughs) 
How did you decide on the location of France for this? Yeah, so complete transparency is that we, uh, it was a small project. It was something we said, we can do this fairly quickly. It's the fastest project we've ever done at Frictional, unless I'm, uh, I'm, I shouldn't say anything about Penumbra in, in the early days, but mm. I mean, after the Dark Descent. Um, so we had a lot of assets that we could reuse from Rebirth that we just felt like a uh, good idea to put it in France. Um, so that's as easy as it was. Um, that, that It wasn't stranger than that, actually, the, the initial. And then we just felt that, that it was working. So we just continued. Okay. Along that route. Speaking of Penumbra, I got a lot of questions about if there's any any ideas for going back to the Penumbra series. Is there anything that's been <laughs> tossed around the studio? I don't know the series myself, but I know that I got a lot of questions about it. Yeah, there's there's no plans on on anything like mm -hmm. that right now. But again, same as same answer as with. I mean. Uh, same answer as with the bunker, basically, that we don't know if there's going to be a sequel for that at the moment either. Do you, so. do you think the, what do you, I don't know what you can say, but I'm curious as to the fate of of our main character, or um, what's his last name? Starts with a C, Clement? Clement. Well, yeah. Um, yeah, I just butchered his name. Uh, <laughs> but, like, I, I love that... Uh, what you hear at the end of the game is also what you hear at the beginning of the game, right? Like you, you've, like you've yep. just ended up right where you were yep. <laughs> with the same you know, enemy. And you're like, oh fuck! Yep. <laughs> and now you're at yep. the bottom of a ditch. And I mean, I just assume that you die, all right? But um, I mean, that's not official. Yeah, I you don't, don't actually. No, I don't, I don't know. Yeah. I mean, it's up to you, and there are certain death is maybe not the, always the case you could become a prisoner or yeah. maybe even hide among the bodies there i i, I let it up to interpretation I, yeah so it's a dark ending how like how did you i mean i don't know i don't know the narratives of the other amnesia games but like that's i mean did you always know you wanted to end the game on such a such a depressing note Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, yeah. I, uh, yeah, I mean, it's awesome. I love I mean, it. It's, I mean, it's war is horrible. I mean, <laughs> it's it's the worst, and uh, and so it's so fun to have you cons like concern yourself with a monster and with rats and stuff, and then coming out and and realizing yeah. well, and then I mean that's kind of what we did also with like the the pillbox area where you get up there and you see uh, you can see outside and you feel like oh sh finally uh, i can get out of here and then all of a sudden a bullet come whizzing at you which oh, is actually wow. really really a fun we wanted it to be this kind of oh so close but yet so far and also hearing the uh, the war and stuff like that but the the bullet is actually an interesting aspect because the the audio our audio guy mike he just put that in and said i added a little flavor so it wasn't part of the initial design and then really uh, and then when we played that it was like this is awesome can we even make real bullets now so so if you hold up uh, uh, a helmet you know that you Mm -hmm. the, the sniper yeah. can hit the helmet if you do that so so that's kind of a spiral of just one idea like that there's many many of those ideas that just came out of nowhere and we just ran with it like another one is actually pouring fuel on so this was but this was not late in the project but still halfway through or something we were talking about okay so we wanted this i've been really like saying i how important it is that you check the gun by opening it and uh, whenever you grab a uh, we call it ready to use button so uh, if you grab the grenade it it gets ready to to pull the pin mm -hmm. and those kind of things even if you don't pull the pin it's something you've done in the game it feels like you are in the world so to say much more because you're doing everything on on screen uh, and one of the questions we had was, okay, so we had the generator filled up by just showing an icon and pressing the button. And we said, that feels wrong since every other action is basically so tactile and in-world. In 
so we said, okay, took the decision to uh, have you take out the fuel and pour it into the generator. But then one uh, the, the Aaron, one of the artists, he said, uh, but if you're going to allow them to pour it in that way, we should be able to pour it on the floor as well. I was like, yeah, then we can put fire to it by shooting at it. So this is kind oh, of wow. how development uh, worked. So it's, it's so many things that just spawned off a central core of this game and just and very few ideas that as i said that got cut cut in the end so it's just things just growing organically from that core which is a very refreshing way to have been running a project so to say it's it's such a nice um, development process <laughs> with this one when the game came um, out and you were watching streams did you see anybody uh, look out the area of the pillbox, not thinking about it, and then getting sniped in the head. Uh, yeah, but <laughs> you don't die from the first shot. But right. uh, yeah, you get injured. But yeah, yeah I've uh, seen that. Um, I've seen what I've seen so many times is people going up there and saying, ah, "What? I can climb out of this." And then the bullet come, and they go like, "Oh shit! Okay, no, I can't do that." <laughs> so, and then uh, the the foreman Stafford is lying there with a with a hole in his eye as well. So, you kind of to reinforce that that's not a good yeah, idea. This is not uh, a good place to be. No. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Um, well, I don't have any other uh, any other questions. I mean, I'm, I I could come up with more if we just hang around here talking, but. Is there anything you wanted uh, to to talk about before uh, before we call it? Anything? Uh, you no, 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 no. This has been super fun. Uh, I love talking about the game with, especially with someone who seems to be liking it this much as much as you do. Then then it's super fun because we get like the super interesting conversation going on. But I'm uh, I'm done. It's actually half past six here in the evening, so I guess the family is waiting for dinner outside. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so. So I think it's a good place to. to yeah, it's good. Yeah, you know, uh, guys, if I didn't uh, ask about something you wanted to hear about, I'm sorry. There's just you know, it's impossible to to get to everything. I'm sure that once we finish this, there's going to be five things and be like, oh, but what about this? What about this? Because this is uh, this is game of the year material for me. Um, I mean, uh, I've. I don't know if you'll be nominated at the Game Awards for for anything, but I, I feel you should for for sound design, for 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 gameplay, for for everything. Oh, actually, you know, what? I, I wanted to ask. Um, early, was it an early on decision to have no music? Yes, um, no music is not correct, but I mean uh, to well, have very little of the. So, so what we did this time, the first time we've done that is kind of a dynamic music system. So, because the game is so open, like the whole world is open from or semi, semi, semi open uh, from the get go, um, that means that the player can go wherever they want back and forth and should do so. And that means that compared to our previous games where you walk into a new area and all of a sudden there's a different feel to the area and you can you can play music that kind of fuels that uh, that feeling that was not the case here so instead what we said let's do what we call like layered music so we have one bass music uh, and then we instead for example when the monster comes out you can hear that there's another layer so it's not a switch in melody or anything like that but it's just a new layer on top of that that increases the tension uh, and the same goes with the different areas when you walk into them they have a different small like just minor adjustments sure. in the, in the in the background so and that was important because i think otherwise you would lose or at least i feel like you would lose immersion a bit because you walk in it becomes more gamey in a sense because the um there's such a more abrupt change that where where it feels almost like the game is telling you you should feel something different here yeah <laughs> and, uh, it, uh, yeah with the with the presentation that's where the difference comes in because this is a game where you're wandering around in the dark in first person uh, you know it compared to like Resident Evil, where there's like a, a a top 
angular camera on a on a character walking through a brightly lit mansion room. Like it's uh, it's different situations call for different kinds of you know atmosphere and music, and so um, hmm. you know where whereas if you if you just take all the music out of a Resident Evil game, I would say that 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 really that would really hurt the atmosphere. But having you know you know, strong musical themes for every room in in the bunker would probably hurt the experience because yes. you'd be listening to the music. Mm. Yeah. And I, I, I think in... It, so the, the key with this project has been to create as strong of an immersion as possible for the player. So everything like checking the gun again and, and all of these things and, and all of the choices that the player has to make. I, I think... From my perspective, why people are saying that Bunker is so immersive is this everything from the big macro decisions that you need to take when you're in the often in the administration office thinking about what should I bring with me? Should mm -hmm. I have this with me? Where should I go? Looking at the map. That's the macro decisions. Then you walk out the door and all of a sudden the micro decisions start where you I, I can go as far as saying I think that even deciding not to pull the flashlight is a decision. I mean, because you you might be walking and you think like, no, I shouldn't pull it now because he could hear me. He's in the next door. It, so, it just yeah. sounds like he's nearby. And those kind of, the more decisions you pile up on the player in that way, they're natural decisions that you do often, the more immersed you get. So I'm like the music comes in there as well. And I'm thinking, I'm hoping they that it plays more on a kind of subconscious level, because even to the point, I don't know if you've seen my Twitter, uh, I have a, a, a also written a thread there about the generator, that when you turn the generator on, there's uh, one of these kind of tones, it's called... Uh, yeah, um, I think I saw that, but you, you could forgot. elaborate on it here. Yeah, uh, what's it called now? The It's called... Uh, oh, my God. Oh, it skips my mind now. It's it's this tone that is becoming a, 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 an audio illusion that something is uh, increasing or decreasing. Yes, but it's yeah. not. Uh, and and that tone is added immediately when you turn on the generator. And it's a we sh went with a down, um, an, a decreasing tone, but it's very very low. So it doesn't really affect you, but it's there all the time. So when you walk out the door, so you're not even close to the generator, that plays in the background. And it causes this kind of subconscious stress, uh, adds to the, to the stress by constantly making you feel like something is running out. And then the second the, the generator dies, that tone stops as well. So it becomes this kind of contrast between... Um, uh, between the that tone and the nothingness. Oh yeah, the you can really sense that nothingness too. <laughs> you know, yeah. one, one moment that I think the thing that screwed me the most, the most in uh, in this game is when I would forget to act to manually load the gun, the pistol bullets, <laughs> yeah. and 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 he's he's coming at me down the hallway. I'm like, all right, motherfucker, and, and I. Yeah. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> but those are the horror movie moments yeah. that we remember. Like, yeah, so yeah. That's, uh, it's great. It's like, and, and it's like something like that would be like a scripted moment in any other game, but it happens yeah. naturally in yours. Yeah, and I've seen some gameplay tests where, and that's when I knew we had something good on that. <laughs> I had a gameplay tests where I could see everything. We had a partner working with a, a great partner on that, uh, and where they. I had a YouTube set up so I could follow the tests and everything. So I watched and then one guy, it was in a, a, one of the smaller rooms in uh, the small cupboards, basically, in, in the prison. And the, the monster came closer and opened up the door and he stood ready with the gun, <clears throat> but he hadn't loaded and he fired. And then he died, of course. And then he was just laughing after that. And then I knew, <laughs> okay, he, he understood it was his mistake. Yeah. He accepted it fully. <clears throat> and he couldn't stop laughing when, even when he had loaded the... <laughs> yeah, because it's, it's your fault, right? It's not the game's yeah. fault. The game didn't screw you, right? No. You didn't reload that damn gun. <laughs> yeah.
<laughs> so I, I just checked uh, here. It's called a shepherd tone. I just wanted that on tape right. as well. Shepherd tone. It's a, it's a super interesting. Uh, it's something used in Dunkirk, for example. They mm. use it a lot in uh, Zimmerman is using it in in movies with. Uh, uh, Christopher Nolan uses it a lot. So, was so, Dunkirk an influential um, movie? No, no. Um, only maybe from the Shepherd maybe for tone. The set, maybe for the setting, yeah. or no. But 1917, 1917. was definitely, uh, and uh, and but that, and also the Western Front. But that came so late, so I wouldn't like. It was late in in production that I watched that one. The, mm. the nothing new on the Western Front. The, Really good movie, I think as well. So, but but 1917 is one of my big favorite movies. I love the whole kind of. I've always been a fan of this, where you have the camera just located in one place in a movie and follows you around like they do in 1917. Have you seen it? I have. Hmm. Yeah, and I was just thinking about the bunker section. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there was definitely with rats and stuff like that, and uh, uh, came in there uh, definitely. So inspiration from from 1970. Well, Frederick, this has been a pleasure. Um, thank you so much for for coming on here and having this talk with me. It's been a true pleasure, actually. So this was super fun. It's hey. a nice Friday evening entertainment. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well. Um, you know, uh, your game is uh, a masterpiece. It is, uh, I would say, it's it's hard it's hard for me to put things on the same level as like the Resident Evil GameCube remake and and Silent Hill two. You know what I mean? Like it's it's mm. it, it feels wrong to do that to me, <laughs> but like I I say that that your game and Signalis are the two games in in the past decade or so the only two that i would even consider putting like in that in that tier or even close to that tier so you've you've really created something special and i hope that everyone in the team feels good about it and i hope you take that confidence into your next project and and just continue to do bold things in your in your game design and, and i hope you continue to make uh, you know wonderful games because uh, we'll definitely be here to appreciate them Thank you very much. I, it's fantastic to hear. So yeah. it's, this is the type of feedback that makes it all worth, you know, <laughs> worthwhile. <laughs> well, that's great. So thank you. Yeah. And I, I mean, I've been trying to have you on here since ever since I played the game back in June, I guess. If I yeah. played it. I was like, I gotta talk to, I gotta talk to somebody about this. <laughs> oh, that's great. Yeah, you've been really eager so i i am but I, it's fun because i've been watching your stuff that the stuff that you put out as i said about the game as well and it just felt right i'm i'm a bit picky i've been a bit picky now it's for me it was like the 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 project was uh we heard from the team members that this was the most relaxed release we've had uh, but i was very much all over the place for the past couple of months and spending weekends and nights playing through the game feeling it and all of that so so i I've, I've decided to like go down in tempo if yeah. that makes sense so i've, I've been, become very picky with uh with like where i spend my time but you're the first one and it feel, felt really right so and it, it's good it's really nice when there's a person that not only like you appreciate what we've done but also understands what we've done and then it becomes such a fun thing to to just jump into and talk about oh well i i really appreciate that thank you so much i gotta take the opportunity by the way to say to, while i have you uh I, I i think i have watched quite a lot of your stuff now not everything and not even close to everything but i really appreciate that you 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 don't seem to really care <laughs> you make your opinions you're very you're very honest about your opinions and i really think that is refreshing uh, <laughs> were you surprised to hear that I, uh, I guess i just wasn't expecting it i was i was expecting something else that, but no, not, I, not that I, I love it yeah. no it's good like i because i don't 
right? I don't, I don't like if I, if, if, if I like something that people don't, or if I don't like something that people do, it's like, Hey, I'm just going to say how I feel about it and try to explain why, try to at least yeah. try to at least make you see where I'm coming from, even if you don't agree. And yeah, yeah. It, for the most You've part, got, it yeah. works. I think you seem to have gotten a bit of like uh, people didn't like what you said about alien isolation. Is that correct? Oh, no, 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 no. Yeah. That, that people do not agree with my take on alien isolation. <laughs> well, thank you. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, Frederick, thanks so much, uh, everyone. Uh, thank you for listening. Uh, and um, we're going to we're gonna end it here. So goodbye, everyone. Goodbye.